Hello, everybody, and welcome to weeks one and two of our video series on the Book of Romans. Since week one in our guidebook is just an overview, I'm going to concentrate on week two, entitled The Gospel as the Revelation of the Righteousness of God. This week covers Romans chapters 1, verses 1 through 17. In this review, I will concentrate on Paul's authorship of this letter to the Romans, as well as what he calls his obligation. After that, in the theological soundings portion of this video, I will talk about Jesus as God's Son, the bodily resurrection of Jesus, and salvation by grace through faith. So let's get started. First, Paul starts this letter in about the same way he starts all of his letters. By introducing himself as the author of the letter, he explains his ministry a little bit, and then he announces who the letter is intended for. And this letter to the Romans is not any different. Immediately after announcing his authorship, he immediately takes the focus off himself and puts it on God. We read, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God, the gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. In verse 2, the word servant can be translated as slave. What Paul is saying is that his only master is Jesus Christ, and his only work is set apart to spread the gospel. If we remember the story in Acts, Paul was on the road to Damascus and was blinded by God. God set another servant named Ananias to fetch him. Of course, Ananias had heard of Paul and knew him to be a man who killed followers of the way. But God assures Ananias that it'll be okay because Paul was set apart and God's chosen instrument to proclaim his name to the Gentiles. Ananias goes into Damascus and under the authority and power of God touches Paul's eyes and restores his sight. It was God's purpose and not Paul's to set him apart to complete God's mission. And Paul starts his letters saying as much. Now, in Romans 1 verse 3, he does something else that is very purposeful. He announces that Jesus is a descendant of King David. Jewish people knew the scriptures. They knew the prophecies regarding the Messiah. Announcing that Jesus was a descendant of David was one way for Paul to announce his intentions in this letter. These intentions are to publicly declare that Jesus is the long-awaited Messiah. Then starting in Romans 1 verse 8, Paul transitions into speaking of his personal ministry. First, he thanks God for the Roman church, saying that their faith is being reported worldwide. He outlines that his ministry is the preaching of the gospel and of praying. He speaks of how he longs to see the Roman church in hopes of sharing his spiritual gifts with them, his gift of preaching and spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he mentions that he wants them to share their spiritual gifts with him. And the fruit of these behaviors will be an encouragement to each other. Then Paul talks about what he calls his obligation. He starts in Romans 1 verse 15. I am obligated both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish. That is why I am so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. When we are obligated to do something, we are indebted to do it. It is mandatory and duty-bound. As a slave to Jesus Christ and God's appointed instrument to spread the good news to Gentiles, Paul calls it his obligation to preach the gospel. That is why he was set apart. That is why he was blinded and then had his sight restored. God chose him. And as we read in the book of Acts, his preaching was always very similar in every town he went. And his letters were also very similar in the retelling of the story. Paul was an educated man. He was a student under the Jewish teacher Gamaliel. But in order to preserve the purity of his message and to glorify God and not himself, he kept to the same formula. He would go into the synagogues at whatever town they were in, speak of Jesus' fulfillment of the prophecies to show that Jesus is the Messiah. Paul would give witness to his blinding on the road to Damascus, 
talk about his conversation with God and how God had restored his sight. And then Paul would preach of Jesus' death and resurrection on the cross for our salvation through the grace of God. Paul always kept it simple, and he always kept the focus on God. I think that's something we can all learn from. When we spread the gospel, we don't need a lot of words or biblical understanding. We just need to speak of how God works in our lives and speak of his death on the cross and bodily resurrection from the dead for the forgiveness of our sins. We may not have a story as powerful as being blinded by God, but we all have stories of how God working in our marriages, in the raising of our kids, in giving us strength to accomplish things we couldn't under our own power. We can share these stories. We all need support. We all need family. We all need a place to grow and feel comforted. And in talking to others about our church, we can share these stories. Really, these first 17 verses of the letter to the Roman church are a template of how we can spread the story of Jesus, how we can be evangelists. Well, that about wraps it up. The summary for this week. Only 17 verses, but they are powerful verses that set the tone for the rest of the letter. Now next, I want to talk briefly on the theological soundings of this week's reading. In Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 17, Paul purposefully opens with and writes about three powerful theological topics. These three topics are, one, Jesus being the Son of God, two, the power of his bodily resurrection, and three, salvation by grace through faith. From a first century perspective, all of these claims would have made Paul a target. As our guidebook states, calling Jesus the Son of God was the same as calling him God. And although the Jewish people were looking for and waiting for a Messiah, they were really looking for a warrior, somebody to rise up the masses, revolt, and save them from Roman rule. They weren't looking for a Messiah to save them from their sins. So, calling Jesus the Son of God was blasphemy, because it was the same as calling him God. And the same goes for the bodily resurrection. First, we need to know that the Jewish sect called the Sadducees didn't even believe in bodily resurrection. So that sect of Judaism would have immediately dismissed Paul and the claim of Jesus as the Messiah. And for the biggest sect, the Pharisees, they would have been cautious at best. But more than likely, they would have been dismissive for the bodily resurrection would have been the biggest and the most substantial point in Paul's claim that Jesus was the Messiah. As Paul would give his testimony, the Pharisees would have mentally started checking off boxes. You know, born a virgin, check. Born in Bethlehem, check. Descendant of David, well, <laughs> check. Bodily resurrection, no way, lies, he blasphemes. From a 21st century perspective, these notions are still under attack. I actually had a classmate in lay ministry school who did not believe in the bodily resurrection. There are leaders in the United Methodist and the global Christian church that do not believe in the bodily resurrection. We have to understand that to believe in God is to believe in his word. And to believe in his word is to believe in heaven. And with that belief comes Jesus's and our, let me say that again, our bodily resurrection to heaven when Jesus returns. We learn about this in the book of Revelation. This is an important part of our theology and important part of what makes Jesus part of the Trinity and our Messiah. Psalm 16.10 says, Because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful one see decay. Isaiah 26.19 says, But your dead will live, Lord, their bodies will rise. Let those who dwell in the dust wake up and shout for joy. Your dew is like the dew of the morning. The earth will give birth to her dead Without a bodily resurrection, Jesus, also known as Yeshua bar Joseph, born from a virgin in Bethlehem from Nazareth, is not Jesus the Messiah. 
For God's word is truth and outlines who the Messiah is, and the bodily resurrection of the Messiah is in there. And in my opinion, is the most important of all the prophecies. Now, lastly, let's talk about salvation by grace through faith. As I said earlier, all of these theological soundings would have been tough for the Jewish people to swallow. Salvation by grace through faith would have been a tough pill to swallow. The Jewish people had the law. God delivered to them tons of rules to follow and ways to atone for those rules. To throw out 1,400 years of tradition would have been crazy for them. The Jewish people understood the law and understood bodily cleansing and their sacrifice of animals for their atonement as the pathway to heaven. They did not understand obedience by faith. In Romans 1 verse 17, Paul quotes Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4. See, the enemy is puffed up. His desires are not upright, but the righteous person will live by his faithfulness. Paul uses the word of God to show Jews and Gentiles that faith and not works or the law will bring them atonement for their sins and salvation into heaven through Jesus Christ. Boom! Paul spends a lot of time in this letter to talk more about salvation by grace through faith, but purposefully adds it in these first few paragraphs to announce his intentions and set the tone for the rest of the letter. So, more to come on that theological topic. Well, that's it. I hope this video has been helpful for you. May your private study time and small group discussions be fruitful. And may God bless you throughout the next nine weeks.